Okay, so um, just to um, uh, start the process, uh, uh, I'm acknowledging the traditional owners of Australia um, and recognising their continuing connection to land, water and culture. Um, I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, just to tell everyone, this is, is being recorded um, and now to introduce uh, Jason, who will be talking about his work in um, the Philippines generally and particularly in Leyte. Okay, just watch that. Thank you, Bob. Hi, everyone. Very good to see you. Very good to see all of you here in person and online. Um, I'm very happy to, to have this opportunity to share with you our work in the Philippines. Um, this work is co-authored by a number of other people. Um, my PhD supervisor is currently online, she's there, Dr. Brooke Wilson from La Trobe University. Um, we also have Pearly Peha, who is also um, who's from Tacloban in the Philippines. So we are well represented <laughs> in this presentation. Um, this photo is taken from Tacloban, a coastal city in the Philippines. Um, that has suffered significant casualties and um, damages in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. And you can see in this photo how climate change, particularly sea level rise, has affected the everyday lives of communities here. And how it is gradually pushing them away from the coastlines where their sources of livelihoods are. Now this is the sort of backdrop that's happening you know, and where our study is situated. Climate change poses significant risk to cities around the world, particularly those that are situated in low-lying areas. Um, coastal cities are susceptible to sea level rise, to storm surges, to flooding, and other hazards. Um, but in addition to these threats, these coastal communities are experiencing rapid urbanization, in-migration, increases in population density, despite these hazards. And climatic impacts also influence the kind of built environment, the property markets, the desirability of residential locations, and the demographic and socioeconomic profile of neighborhoods. And so in this study, we're particularly interested in this phenomenon called climate gentrification. We ask, what are its drivers and what are its differential impacts on communities? More on this later on. Um, but um, I think as cities begin to respond to climate change, they're rolling out this diverse kind of climate adaptation interventions Recent research calls for greater attention to their social implications and impacts, especially with regards to equity and justice. So the primary motivation behind this research project really came from my PhD study, um, which is in another coastal city in the Philippines called Iloilo. Now, so at this point, I'd like to backtrack a little bit and give a bit of a research genealogy to better explain the motivation and the inspiration behind this research project. So I, in 2019, or, uh, 2018, when I did my fieldwork, I looked at this massive flood control project in the in Iloilo. It's called Iloilo Flood Control Project. This was funded by JBIC, Japan Bank. Um, it's a $110 million kind of project. And the objective of this is to, you know, the, the usual infrastructure project, renovating rivers, dredging canals, constructing floodways to divert waterways to the sea. Now, I don't have much detail to explain. I don't have time to, to explain, you know, much details in, in, of this project. But in general, several communities have been relocated to make way for this construction of the flood control project. Now, as this is one of the largest projects undertaken by the Iloilo government, uh, four external NGOs help out. NGO A, B, C, and D. NGO A is the most politically connected NGO. Um, they are regularly involved in the relocation process in the Philippines. They're only able to relocate 172 households, but the relocation is not free. It's, you know, with a loan. So people had to pay for, for the houses to get to be relocated to NGOA. NGOs B, C, and D, they're, relative, they're free. So you can just move in, you don't have to pay for anything. Um, but you just have to contribute your own labor to it. So, but these houses are smaller, as you can see, they're only 20 square meters and only one story high. Now, these are what the houses look like from the four NGOs. You can see that there is stark inequality in terms of the, the housing, the houses from the four NGOs. Houses from NGOs B, C, and D look kind of dilapidated. During the interviews, residents complained about several things like being flooded, you know, 
um, very hot, poor drainage, etc. But houses from NGOA, as you can see from that photo, they're really looking really good. They have air conditioning, they have their own gates, they have the own new res residents have their own cars. Um, and so the question, so we ask ourselves, you know, why is this so? Um, you know, why are the houses and conditions in NGOA better compared to the others? Where are, we're in, they're all living in the same resettlement site. And so we look into the selection process of who gets into NGOA versus who gets into the other NGOs. And here's the selection criteria. Well, for one thing, the BET NGOA has two sets of selection criteria. So in the first criteria, of course, you should be affected by the flood control project. But what's not disclosed to the public is the second criteria, which is they look at people's capacity to pay the loan. They look at people's capacity to a willingness to pay, willingness to save money, willingness to dismantle their, their old house and those kind of things. So this second round of you know, a selection is where it gets tricky because you need to be able to, to do all of those things. NGOA, as I said, is the, is the NGO partner of the government. And as you can see here, uh, the regional director of NGOA. So one of the NGOA officials is a member of the Iloilo Fund control team. And so she, she has attended several meetings with the government and she has built this relationship with the government. And in fact, because of that, she was able to make NGOA one of the accredited kind of preferred relocation partner of the city government, as you can see in the list of accredited NGOs released by the government. Of course, it helps if you know someone from the government. Um, they can easily refer you to NGO. And this is, these two letters are examples of referral letters given by the government, which got me into trouble a little bit, but they had to read up the names and all that. But you can see that um, here, the, the, the politicians are requesting certain people, their political allies, to be included in their housing project. Um, and so I'm hoping for a favorable, a favorable action on my request to, for better collaboration. So I mean, if you get this kind of letter, the NGOA felt insulted, but she didn't have any choice but to accede, but to, to give it to the request, to, to have this smooth relationship with the government. And this kind of un perceived unfairness in the resettlement process generated social privileges within the community. Ideally, living close to one another should develop these bonds, right, and relationships. But what happened here is these differences in housing quality served as a permanent reminder that some people benefited more compared to others. Um, there were verbal applications, NGOs, BCNB were left out, they were segregated. In fact, residents of NGO we constructed this gate that you can see here because they didn't feel, they didn't feel safe to be around with the, with the members of the other NGO. So in fact, NGOA referred to themselves as university, whereas the, they referred to others as merely primary schools. So this kind of discriminatory attitude uh, was there. Unfortunately, I ran out of time in my fieldwork. I, I didn't get to explore this kind of social privileges a bit more. And so, um, but what I wanted to highlight here is that, you know, the, the political drivers are really strong in such a climate resettlement project. And I wanted to pursue this a bit more in future projects. And so, in 2021, I attended this adaptation workshop hosted by the University of Michigan. Um, and that's where I met Jin, Jin, Jin Kwaton is also a PhD, was a PhD student based in Hong Kong, and we realized we have the same, we share the same interest, and he's from Tacloban, and so uh, I linked him up with, with Brooke, who's my PhD supervisor, and so the two of them did field work with Purdy um, just this March, just this March 2023. And so um, now I'll present some of the things that they found in, in Tacloban, and I'm so happy that Brooke and Purdy are here with us to join the discussions later on. Please note that this is just an appetizer. Uh, we are still processing our data as we speak. We are particularly interested in this concept called climate gentrification, which is described by, by BEST as a process by which existing residents are displaced due to economic, physical, social investments in the community. It's climate risk and different types of adaptations you know, that cities undergo may drive gentrification. So climate change makes some locals less desirable due to their heightened degrees of exposure uh, to extreme weather events and associated divestment in, in, the, in the economic, physical, social domains, while other locals are made more desirable by the degree of protection and investment 
in economic, physical, and social community domains. And so as a result, wealthier households may afford themselves a greater protection, whereas lower income households are displaced and moved out, um, moved out uh, just like the traditional gentrification process. So please note again that this is just a work in process, a progress. We have some difficulty securing interviews with the sellers and buyers of houses because it's illegal. It's an illegal practice in the Philippines. So we're having difficult time securing responses for that. Um, there is already a bit of a literature on climate gentrification, particularly in a global north context. This seminal work of Keenan shows that climate gentrification may manifest through several proposed pathways, including um, superior investment pathway, wherein an investment into a low risk area, such as you know, elevated properties and higher elevation, um, and this investment from high risk areas, cause both high income households and low income households to move. There is another pathway called cost burden pathway, wherein low income residents are displaced, as only the wealthier households can afford to bear the rising cost of living. Um, living in such high risk geography, such as due to you know increases in property values, rising prices, prices of insurance, and those, those kinds of things. So resilience investment pathway uh, it refers to the you know, where infrastructure investment aimed at reducing climate risk increases property values and leads to the displacement of low income households. So we're kind of wondering which pathway um, is present or you know, what we see in a study context in the global south like the Philippines. Would it fit any of these models of climate gentrification that's out there in the literature? So that's what we're wondering about. Um, we also looked at conceptual frameworks of climate gentrification out there in the literature, and we found one that's particularly useful. This figure highlights that climate gentrification is a multi-spatial, multi-factorial, and multi-temporal process. And according to this framework, Climate gentrification happens across the global, uh, regional, local levels. It's comprised of social, economic vulnerability and um, environmental variables, and it can occur in different stages. Um, you know, historic events but also uh, can lead to the kind of uneven distribution of risk. Now, all these components are interconnected, and any change in one group of variables can be a driver for others. Now, while this conceptual framework is certainly useful, what we found in our review of the literature is that climate gentrification has not largely been operationalized in this kind of multifactorial way. Um, existing literature on climate gentrification primarily focuses on the process by which the primary impetus for gentrification are environmental kind of factors. So there's really a bit of environmental determinism in the climate gentrification literature. In coastal communities, environmental security is operationalized by variables such as elevation, uh, property values as proxies for potential gentrification. And so as critical ge human geographers, we feel that there's definitely more to the story than these variables alone. Um, this primary focus on environmental variables obscure other factors that are important to the gentrification process. And as I've seen in my case study in Iloilo, power and politics play a major role in shaping the processes and outcomes of climate resettlement. It helps make you know, some groups more protected but others are made more vulnerable. Some of the research questions that we've asked for this particular research project, for this particular project is this. What are the political economic drivers of climate gentrification that has a result that as a result of has resulted from being relocated as a climate intervention? Um, what are people's different sorry, so what motivates people to buy and to sell? You know, who are these buyers and sellers and how do they do their selling and buying? And lastly, what are people's differential experiences of protection and material standing as a result of gentrification? This photo shows the signage of a no-build zone within 40 meters of the coastline in high affected areas in Tacloban. This policy banned the construction of infrastructures along the coast. I'll talk more about this in the next slide and how this is actually very political. So this is our case study site. Um, that's the map of the Philippines. It's a small um, uh, province over there on the, on the right. And Super Typhoon Haiyan wreaked devastation in this particular area, <laughs> cost more than 6,000 lives, okay? And, le and leaving so many infrastructure and neighborhoods in ruins. And so this coast like here, this coast here, this yellow one is called Anibong. And that's where most of the destruction happened, okay? And so the government of the Philippines declared it as a no-build zone and compelled residents who lived here to relocate elsewhere. And so that's where the relocation site is about 10 kilometers 
um, away from from Anibal, from the coast. Um, now, this is where the resettlement process gets a bit political. Because later on, the national government tweak this no-build zone to, and change it to a no-dwelling zone. So this means that the policy allows the construction of commercial infrastructures for fishing and for tourism purposes, mm -hmm. but prohibited the construction of residential infrastructure within this unsafe zone. So in other words, the people that the government relocated okay, are those that are informal, not those who don't have um, kind of tenure to stay here. People who are former, formal landowners and those who have commercial properties eventually didn't have to, to relocate, didn't have to dismantle and destroy their own properties. In other words, they can continue to operate. And so the resettlement site is situated in Barangay Balakay, as I said. It's about 10 kilometers from Manibong, but it's close to um, major facilities like the color yellow one, that's the, sorry, the, the red one, that's the hospital, the big hospital there, schools, um, there's also a big church that's being constructed, you can see in the photo there. Um, there's also the planned construction of a bypass road, a Toyota showroom, and a shopping center. So all of this is being constructed in this resettlement site. Um, so th this is, this resettlement site is being developed by uh, a Catholic NGO called Catholic Relief Services. They're from the US. And so they work closely with the Catholic Diocese of Tacloban, that particular, because the, the church owns the land. So the church owned the land. Um, they began construction in 2017 and finished in 2019. CRS partnered with the National Social Housing Corporation, the Philippines, called Pag-Ibig, to enroll each family into a national, into a home loan program. So the houses are you know, based on loans with low interest rates and minimal monthly payments. CRS helped the families navigate the bureaucratic and expensive government land tenure system ensuring that they're able to provide and submit all the requirements obtained so that they can obtain their land title. But what I'd like to highlight here in this slide is how Dreamville, that's the name of the resettlement site, is being prepped as prime land. Okay, this, this is where, you know, and our interviews serve as a testament for this. Dreamville is the best place to live. You know, that's why you know, the prices here are increasing. So the methods that we did were, where we did household survey with 300 respondents that's still currently being processed. Um, we looked into residents' live experiences within this resettlement site, their views about the changes that's happening around them, so some indicators of gentrification, and their plans for the future. Um, then we tri triangulated this with 25 interviews with government officials, buyers and sellers, and community leaders. So we're using NB able to do that, it's still being conducted. Um, so here are some of our findings. First, who moved into this resettlement site? So who are the original, the, the original resettlers? So it's supposed to be, as you can see from the survey, um, mostly low-income households. Um, they are daily job earners, so they don't have the kind of formal employment, so they just depend on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're affected by typhoons. In the interviews, the government is admitting to forcibly removing these people away from their old homes in Anibal. And these are some of the photos, our documentation of how they are being forcibly removed out of their house. You can see that there's a cross there on the door of the house. And that cross means that your, heart, your house is marked for demolition. The interview, we interviewed one man here and we asked him, how do you understand that sign over there that the government you know, posted in front of your door? And he said, oh, that's the date when we will be, you know, when the, our house will be demolished. And so we explained to him that actually it's not the date. This is the number you know, of regulation, the policy number um, <laughs> that, you know, your house is, you know, basically going to be demolished. So in other words, the government stuck this science in the houses without any explanation at all. And there's a lot of confusion going on uh, about what's going on in, the, in this demolition process. <coughs> now, let us zoom in particularly to this resettlement site in Dreamville, because all this talk of future investments have made people perceive that the value of their land is really increasing. And so the estimated value of their house, this is information given to them by Pag-Ibig, that's the, that's the one that gives them the housing loan, um, has, as you can see, their, their perceived value has increased over time, 73% value, so it's like double, double the value of their house. Um, people shared that the personality, following the survey, the personality of their neighborhood has changed, 
that people are selling and buying properties, that new people are strangers are coming in. And I think one of the powerful survey results that we found here is that those who felt that they'll be forced out of their neighborhoods are those who don't have any income at all. So it's the poor who felt like they'll be displaced anytime soon. Okay. Some other indicators of climate gentrification is this. We ask respondents, in what ways are people moving into your neighborhood different than you? And so the respondent, you know, people who are move moving in are different in terms of income and wealth, in terms of occupation and job. Um, and this interview is quite telling. Um, the interviewer asked, do you think your financial status is different from, from, the, from the people who are coming in? And said, yes, they can afford to pay in cash. They're working, they're professionals, and they're well-behaved. Um, but, you know, there's this tendency that they will look down on us because we're poor. It reminds me of the, the finding that I have in Iliilo, the social privileges, where in this kind of discriminatory attitudes are you know, kind of ingrained in people's minds. So it's the same thing that's happening over here. Next question is, who are the sellers? Um, and what, are the dri what drives them to sell? And some of the emerging things from the interviews include, there are people who can't pay the mortgages. I mean, they, some of them kind of overstated the income that they have, and so, so that they'd be able to secure the house, and then eventually they can't pay for the house. So what they're telling us is, we just sell the house instead of, you know, um, we're not getting anything back in return. So we'd rather sell the house than not get, get, not, not get anything at all. Um, those who are disabled, um, we had one interview with the disabled, he has bad arthritis, he could not continue to fish, and so he eventually ended up forfeiting on his property and selling it to somebody else because he can't pay for the mortgage. The elderly, the most vulnerable, um, those who don't have livelihoods because, as I said, it's 10 kilometers away from the coast, and some who thought that education is better in the city. Now, if you receive this red envelope here in this photo, um, then you better fear because that's a sign that the government is coming for you. Um, our, but in reality, so this is like a warning that you're not paying for your mortgages on time. And, but in reality, our interview suggests that nobody has been taken away from their homes due to this red envelope. But still, you know, it creates a sense of fear among the interviewees if they receive the kind of envelope. Now, how do the sales happen? Okay, how do they sell the house? Um, still requires further research for this, and we need to follow it up more. But it seems that um, online sales are, is the one that's likely that's happening in, in, in Dreamville Resettlement Site. Now, this goes against the standard practice of, of putting a sign outside your door, because this is what's practiced in Tacloban City, on the right side. Now, that on the left, the online selling is what's being practiced in the resettlement site. So we find that when people post something on social media and some member of our team had to, to be a member of that so that they can see this kind of selling that's happening. Um, they would then delete their kind of um, profile a few days after because they feel that the government is going to, to catch them. So what happens after they sell their houses? Where do they go? Some would just go back to where they live. So some would go back to Anibong, to the coast, the yellow part a while ago. Some would hide in other provinces because they knew that what they did was illegal. Some would go to a different resettlement site to stay with their family and relatives. In general, there is this stigma that if you sell your house, people will call you out and people will judge you because you're not supposed to sell your house. I mean, that's, that's not the, the right thing to do. So the sellers, they don't stick around. They move to another place. Now, the next question is, who are the buyers? And what are their motivations to buy? Okay, now. There appears to be different types of speculation happening amongst the buyers in terms of location, so in terms of finance, environment, and political speculation. Um, some would speculate the kind of, because the property of the land has increased over time, so they feel that they get a lot of money, you know. So some have turned it into a business that they purchase multiple houses in different resettlement sites. We're not sure how they did that. We have to, think, we have to probe it a bit more. Um, some would speculate in terms of environmental because they knew that this resettlement site has never been flooded. So it is really, communities are protected here. But also there's a bit of a political speculation going on. We, we were told of a story of an opposition leader who bought um, hundreds of houses here in this resettlement site and then gave it to his political allies and told them, you can stay here, but you must vote for me. Okay, so eventually, you know, this local politician won this part of town but not the entire election. So he was 
also felt very disappointed. But anyway, it just shows that you know some of the house resettlement house are being owned by the politicians themselves. In terms of who are buying, so we have those politicians. We also have um, government, so government officials, the wealthier people, so health professionals from the hospital. You saw the hospital that's very close to the resettlement site. Um, seafarers and other overseas Filipino workers. In fact, one buyer we spoke to has a PhD. <laughs> has a PhD. So there, those are the buyers. But aside from health professionals, the seafarers and, profession and other professionals, our informants said that certain local officials received access to these houses even if they were not at risk to flooding and sea level rise. We were told the following in the interviews. Those in government, so you see that uh, this is a small privilege. So that's kind of that this is a small privilege that we should give to the local officials for all their hard work. So they deserve some of these houses here. Um, all, but all, all local officials were given houses of CRS. So those in government have more stable income compared to the original residents who are being forced out because they cannot pay for they can't pay for their mortgages. And what, this is really what I think is odd here in the Philippines. Like it's the politicians who make the law. You're not supposed to buy these kinds of, money. but they're also the ones who break the law. And so now we will see, and we need more photos of this assessment, but you'll see that there is the kind of difference in housing units within the same resettlement site. Same phenomenon that I've seen in Rilo, it's happening here. The houses owned by professionals being, you know, be, being upgraded. Um, the houses owned by the original relocates remain the same. Um, and our surveys indicate that those with high income feel that they have a secure job, you know, that they have enough food, that their income is enough for their family needs. On the other hand, those who, with low income feel that they don't have a secure job, they don't have enough food, and their income is not enough for their family's needs. So in conclusion, um, what we're seeing is early stages, definitely, of climate gentrification. Uh, going back to Keenan's framework, we feel that what we've seen is a combination of three, so it doesn't fit to the current framework. Um, there is definitely superior investment pathway here because, as you can see, several investments and in, um, properties are being targeted and constructed in the resettlement site. There is the cost burden pathway wherein the poor are unable to pay for the houses, and so they're moved out, they're forced to sell. There's also the resilience investment pathway wherein the houses in Dreamville are known to be climate resilient and flood proof. Climate gentrification has been driving social change within this resettlement site. People are selling and moving elsewhere back to their own, back to their old province or other estate. Others see gentrification as adding value to their home, so they hold on to them as much as they can and then until the prices go up. Others see gentrification as an opportunity to sell but others are forced to sell because they can pay their mortgages. Just like in Iloilo, we've seen that power and politics play a major role in driving gentrification. This is evidenced by the houses that the government officials receive. You know, it is their privilege. Even though they're not living in flood-prone areas, or the political speculation that politicians engage in in the buying of resettlement houses to give to political allies. This highlights the need to kind of expand and you know, emphasize the role of politics and power in the current framework of climate gentrification. We fear that as Dreamville resettlement site has turned into a climate resilient and you know kind of development paradise for a few professionals, right? For a few overseas workers and government officials, it's also pushed away its vulnerable members, the poor, the disabled, the elderly, back to danger zones, ultimately defeating, defeating the purpose of protecting them against climate change. So that's our that's where we are right now, and yeah, very happy to, to discuss if you have any questions at all. Justin, can I just ask a quick clarification question? What, so why aren't people allowed to buy and sell in the resettlement site? Is it a different kind of tenure system, or what is it that stops that from happening? Is it a moral? <laughs> you're not supposed to because you were gifted this in the Philippines they have this term called professional squatting like because some some of these people who are afford who can afford to buy and sell houses so when they do that I mean it leaves very little 
for the really poor who can't afford to have any of those houses. So when the government noticed this happening in some of the other resettlement sites, so it's been happening nationwide, um, they eventually put forth this regulation that bans you from buying and selling your house. But unfortunately, um, it's just a matter of <laughs> policy, but what's happening in the ground is people are still doing it anyway. It's just a suggestion, not really being enforced strictly. Okay, any, any other questions, including anyone online? Please raise your hand or send a chat or something like that. Yep. Thanks, sir. I'm just thinking around this concept of climate gentrification exactly and, and what, it, what it means. I'm not going to talk through it again, maybe I, I missed something, but obviously you've got a resettlement project, right? And people are moving in, they're being gifted houses or loan houses in some cases, and then they're being bought out. Yeah, so is, is that second part, is that the gentrification itself? And the link to climate, I mean, the fact that it was a resettlement from a typhoon, is that the link? Or in the literature, is it is it more poorly linked to climate in some other way? I guess I'm trying to work out the exact link. Can you talk through it a bit more? Sorry. No, no, no that's okay. Um, actually, I think that people are not being bought out. I mean, they're really forced, the kind of, because they can't afford to pay for the mortgages because of the increasing cost of living, they're being forced to sell their house. Um, but maybe I want to give a chance to Brooke to say something here. Brooke, do you want to talk about, you want to say something to the group? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I, the link here it, from the climate perspective is that the uh, value of these houses is going up in part because of the climate resilience. Um, one of the things that we saw in the advertisements for selling these houses is that they are flood free. Um, so it's one of the reasons why they are so valuable, um, but also that this is the settlement would be here without the extreme weather event happening in the first place. Um, so we've got a confl confluence, obviously, of broader uh, gentrification um, issues as well. But I think the difference here is is this climate change factor, um, which is why we were interested in linking it into the climate gentrification literature that we've seen that's mostly being uh, produced from studies in um, the global north. Sorry, yeah, I was just um, thinking, you know, it seems in a lot of spheres, not just housing, that increased climate risk decreases value and um, decreased climate risk increases value. So we're the ones in a corporation or housing development. And that seems to me what the link is, the potential with housing to have the decreased risk, increasing value, just a sort of process, an inexorable process of the value increasing and therefore gentrification occurring through value increase. That, that's how I was interpreting what was happening there. And is that, is that the way it's generally in the other climate gentrification literature? Is that sort of the, the key aspect of it? Yeah? I think so. <laughs> no, I'm just not familiar with that. Literature. Yeah, yeah I, th I think so. I mean, that's what we've seen in um, cities of, let's say, Miami, you know, um, in some of the um, literature that uh, these high elevation zones that are, you know, supposed to be protected from sea level rise and flooding, just increasing in value. But also the, like, production of eco-luxury housing leading into gentrification. So you think about the way of investments in Barangaroo being sold as eco, you know, eco, yeah, eco-luxury apartments that have then had broader impacts all over the West Plains and so on. Um, so those investments in not just not just the physical characteristics of the location, but also the type of housing that has been built. And so in that way, linked to kind of reduced emissions as well as climate risk profiles. By the way, we've also seen this um, concept called green gentrification, where in this is similar to resilience investment, where there's a lot of investment in, you know, parks, um, kind of green spaces um, to make like, make it more you know green and it also increases the value but also in the literature it shows how this has displaced and pushed away you know the low income residents.
So is it also tied into the initial relocation of the people that are living um, in, in houses that have been damaged or they're too close to the to the ocean? Um, because I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about you know, in a place like Jakarta where you have a gentrification that's occurring in order and to control flood risk of people that are living in slums along uh, or living in shanty areas or along um, the rivers and drains in the city. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I come in. I came into this thinking that that would be the sort of more the case, and that initial relocation being the, the act of of gentrification and creating these nice middle class neighbourhoods based on law and order, but also using uh, in, you know environmental protection or flood protection as a justification. Do you want to respond? But if you ask me, it's the second kind of. In a way, this is the second layer of gentrification that we've seen. I mean, communities in the first place, they're not meant to be, they're, they're all meant to be, you know, low income, those who are, you know, living in the flood prone, as flood prone areas, they're the ones who are supposed to be relocated. Mm -hmm. So in, in that, you know, case, idealistically, there shouldn't be kind of segregation that's happening because it's the same kind of community, the same neighborhood that's being moved out. But what we've seen is because some of the residents are not able to afford to stay there, in those houses, they're forced to sell and making way to the professionals who are able to, to pay for these mortgages. Um, and so that's the second level, I think, of gentrification that we, we've seen. Manju, you have a question? Yeah, just as a follow-up to uh, some of these earlier questions, I was just wondering whether it would be interesting to look at the gentrification aspect from the point of view of the rehabilitation sites itself. You know, what were those lands uh, actually, were they just vacant lands or was there something else going on there? Because, you know, it seems that those lands were opened up precisely with the climate, uh, you know, with the climate argument that yes. you need to create safer zones for people to move into. But then it's not the fishermen and the people who really need that safety who actually finally get that space. <laughs> they actually go back because... Yes. You know, for a fisherman to live 10 kilometers away from the coast is absolutely meaningless. So they actually go back, but these it's the other people, the professionals and the government officials who land up there. So I'm I'm just wondering whether you know that part of the uh, that that part of the dynamics provides some particular ways of understanding gentrification. In fact, this is not just one resettlement site that we're talking about. There are about 10. I think, Perley, how many resettlement sites have the national government, had the city government constructed to relocate these communities affected by Typhoon Ion? Um, are you there, Perley? I think Perley. she's having trouble with her connection. Hello? Can I be heard now? Yes, we can hear you, Perley. Oh, okay, so there are about 10 resettlement sites. All are located in Tacloban North, but Greenville, our research area, is the one that is closest to the downtown. Yes, and previously, there, these lands were vacant lands. Perley, why is it that the, gov why is it the government or you know, different developers are focusing on Greenville particularly in terms of development? Okay, aside from it's the one that's closer to downtown area because EVR, EVRMC is right there. And also relatively, Greenville, um, in, as compared to the other resettlement sites in Tacloban City, Greenville is way more better when it comes to how it looks, when it comes to the structure, and all, all other variables actually. Greenville is a lot better compared to the other resettlement sites in Tacloban City. It's way more difficult to live in other resettlement sites. Yeah. I should also add there's another motivation for the resettlement here. Initially, the plan was to create kind of a boulevard in the Anibong area. Um, however, with COVID um, and the supply chain issues, the government has taken the opportunity to create a new port um, 
from that land to the land along the coastline there is really valuable. So they have been wanting to remove these informal settlers for many decades. Um, however, it was only with Typhoon Haiyan hitting the area and um, all of the NGOs around the world looking at, at this location and wanting to provide money as support that they were ab able to actually afford to resettle people. Um, so it's kind of, I suppose, the interaction between these um, these NGOs um, around the world providing all of these funds to the Takleban city um, government and um, and also their, their want of this land for other purposes. So there's a whole lot of things going on here, not just uh, climate change. Can I just follow? I, that was going to be my question, like what is the relationship between those two sites? And you talked about the way that the, the different kinds of le legislations, regulations they produced around what that land could be used for. I'm wondering whether like you could bring up and just what Brooke is saying there, it really speaks to the, the way different kinds of speculations and different kinds of speculations that people have been able to take rather than necessarily gentrification itself. But it seems to me like a whole lot of speculative activity, speculating on housing, land value, climate risk, taking a speculative position on climate risk because while it is being sold as being flood free, it's flood free by matter of they're not having yet been a flood mm -hmm. rather than they're not going to be a flood. So these different kinds of risk positions, speculative positions, in a, like from a whole variety of different actors, I think. I don't know, that seems to me, that it seems, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I suppose what we're grappling with at the moment is how to represent that within all of the other gentrification drivers that are going on there because being so flood free is not the only well and I actually would probably argue it's it's a minor reason for people buying there it's mostly the location of the hospital nearby and doctors needing um needing to to live somewhere nearby um and and those things are what are probably driving them into the area first um and then obviously the the fact there's been no flooding there um is, is important too so yeah there's multiple i suppose multiple things going on there that we're trying to unpack at the moment um particularly because the term Climate gentrification, or even gentrification, is is not um, well known in the Philippines. Um, so uh, we spoke to the city government in depth, and they they inevitably always asked us, "What do you mean by gentrification?" So that was interesting as well. Um, that the terminology is not something they're familiar with, and um, that it's very much kind of seen as a Western Western word at this point. Yeah, there's lots of research or lots of studies about that in urban studies about whether gentrification makes sense in the global south at all yeah 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 and that's something we've been talking about um whether how we're going to frame this um and whether we're going to i suppose pursue the um the climate gentrification angle um at, at this stage i'd be interested in your um opinion on that sophie yeah we can talk about that later. <laughs> Sorry, I jumped in front of you. That's okay. okay. On that specific topic. That's all right. I just want to thank you. Wow, what a fantastic seminar. And um, I'm Melissa Haswell. I don't know too many of you, but I'm with Geosciences and also, and I just run with the SLEEK program, uh, Service Learning in Indigenous Communities with Suzanne Kenny and the DBCISS. I'm saying that because we have just been to the North Coast. And we have seen so much of these trends happening there. Um, and climate change really has done a whole lot of things. It's basically there. It tipped a housing shortage into a housing crisis, which means people from all over the region who really got flooded out are being put in hotels and motels and anything else across the entire region. And they have to move every two weeks. It's, it's a crazy situation. Um, and then, and I guess on top of COVID, where people who from Sydney said, oh, I can, I don't have to work in Sydney anymore. I can move out to the coast and enjoy everything out there and still have my job, which incredibly has raised prices, as you can imagine, and done what you've seen there. Um, but then they start trickling back to Sydney because it's not very exciting out there. And you have empty mansions out there 
or going to Airbnbs. So, yeah, it's, and I, and I guess what I was thinking about, is it in the global south? Is it really about inequality? And when you have inequality, it will happen anywhere. I don't know. It's a question I was just thinking that you defined really well. If you have people who have a rich, you have a lot of money to live where it's so beautiful, even if they, even if they don't have to stay there when things get really bad, but, and then the developers get on board. And I think that in Australia is huge, that the amount of money that developers make out of the situation. So yeah, just sort of throwing in that, but so, so interesting. And you've helped me clarify a whole lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. And the loss of bushland, I think that's also really important for the welfare of these countries. These are cutting down the trees because it's so valuable to put up houses now. If nobody's looking after the environment, then it's the first thing to go. I wonder though if, has anyone written about the kind of things that are happening in Australia? Those kind of gentrification things. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, about gentrification of Redford. <laughs> you just brought me a whole way of seeing, or at least some vocabulary around what we're seeing across the North Coast. And Aboriginal, our focus has been with Aboriginal people. It's an absolute crisis. I think I've never really thought about the idea of climate gentrification much before. I think like. As you say, it's an evolving term. And I think it's sort of, to my mind, thinking about it, it's it's very much about the idea that the, the increased costs and risks associated with climate are somehow internalised into property prices, mm -hmm. leading to places that are more remote from risk, appreciating in value and going the other way. The point is, I kind of, I'm not sure I agree with simplicity, because I think that sort of, in the North Coast, and I've similarly been looking at that recently, I'm not seeing any evidence that those climate risks are mm. trickling into the housing market. Mm. I'm seeing ongoing, and the power of the development lobby, I completely agree, yeah. what we're seeing is massive pushes to open up more land for residential purposes in highly climate risky settings for flood mm. and stuff like that. And I'm not seeing, I'm certainly not seeing the market operate efficiently, and I'm seeing governments or best wishes being stymied by the developing development lobby. There's a bunch of debates going on in Wire and Shire about that at the moment, which are the development lobby is just like trying to term is the balanerization of Byron, which I think is hilarious. And in fact, I do agree with what you say about the sort of issue of the large lots that are be, I'm not sure they're becoming vacant, but they're so ill suited to the development dynamic. Wait, there's so much land which is, it's, it's not used for productive purposes, it's used for some vague amenity purpose, which is basically keeping a distance from your neighbour, mm -hmm. growing weeds in between. And you're just seeing an extrapolation of these bad planning decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, from a climate change lens, there's no prerogative to take into account climate risk, either by the market or government seriously yet. So. I, I was, I'm sorry, that's a bit, of, a bit of a rant, but I think the, I think the point I'd make is that you talk about climate gentrification. Sorry, sorry. Is that is that the Philippines example you use? I think it's sort of institutional. It's institutional resettlement and the gentrification coming out of institutional resettlement, whereas climate gentrification is kind of got in the examples of Miami, Venice, whatever. It's got more organic quality. The idea that rich people are getting out of flooded areas, and I think it's probably it is happening in Venice and Miami to the extent I know that. I'm not sure it's happening in Australia, you know? Yeah. But th that's why I wonder, but don't you think those diff that's a different actors taking on different speculative positions? Yeah, I agree. So it's developers yeah. Yeah. taking Who on can, climate risk yeah. for short-term financial Absolutely, risk. because you've got property prices going up 50% a year there. Yeah. So they're thinking we're just going to sell it off and you know what, in 10 years time it's going to be underwater, but who cares? Yeah, they don't <laughs> care because they've already yeah. made their money. Yeah. Yeah. And the buyer gets overwhelmed with yeah. wanting to live there and emotions yeah. rather than all the local councils object to it, they get taken to the land and environment court, and you've got development pressure on them. Yeah. But so, one of the interesting things in Miami, which they write about, is the role of insurance in these processes. Yes. And so, that I think is a different, that also is a, like a speculative risk kind of question. And, and I mean, insurance in the US is particular, like house insurance is, is a really particular 
manifestation, but I think that yeah. that kind yeah. of intervenes in this in different ways too. But insurance in Australia is linked to flood zone classifications. Which is the same which are in now the US. out of date for the climate reality which is, that we have. Which is the same in the US, yeah. except there's, yeah. um, which the federal government yeah. um, manages, but but the way that that's linked to property taxes and local government revenue is really particular. It's fascinating, Justin. It's really mm -hmm. interesting set of issues. Are there any other questions or comments? Claudia uh, online made a comment, but I think it's, uh, can you click on the chat again? It says, great presentation, thanks. It also seems like politics and action as usual and letting market dynamics drive behaviour without regulation and social protection considerations. I, I, I'm not so much sure that that's a comment, uh, sorry, a question is a, a, a pretty obvious, a pretty useful comment. So any, any other questions from online or here? Sorry, well, yeah, I was just thinking about that, um, that discussion about um, relocation, you know, perhaps not in itself being climate gentrification. But I think what happens is relocation, climate relocation becomes the mediating stage that then yeah. leads to gentrification. Land grabbing and gentrification. Yeah, yeah, and so, I mean, there are many ways you can get to that yeah. stage of adding, value, you know, accumulating value through, through housing, but this, this is a particular case whereby climate relocation has been the trigger. But of course, there are many other triggers. It's the fact of getting people off land, you know, that, that's valuable for other purposes. And, and this has become a, a sort of a reason it can be done legitimately with the imprimatur of all these NGOs. Um, so that's the way I suppose I think about the process it's a sort of indirect climate gen gentrification, if you like. But the other thing I was thinking about was it just seems so... I, I can't understand how all these NGOs didn't figure out that people who were being moved, who had livelihoods on the coast and were being moved away from the coast, there wasn't any provision or planning. Uh, I'm just... Why wouldn't... You know, you, you can't have fisher people working living so far away, Where, what, why was there that gap? Or... That's a big question. Rook, do you want yeah, to... they, um, the livelihoods component of this was um, left to the city government to deal with. Um, so that's that's become the big problem. And they, ha they do have some plans in place. For example, they're going to set up kind of a dormitory situation along the coast where the fishermen can live during the week and then return to their houses um, on the weekend. But people aren't just returning to Anibong because of fishing. Um, they've they've got Sari Sari stores um, they, where they sell bits and pieces and also for education to be nearer to the new school. So um, it, there's also a, just been a, a problem with city government. Can, there was, a, I think because... You had an NGO that took over this resettlement site and the city government uh, managed the rest of the resettlement sites. And so um, I think their nose was out of joint a little bit with how this proceeded and they were responsible for uh, providing services to the Dreamville site as well, which they haven't done. So m most of the houses were still um, bringing in water from the well to their homes um, and there, there was a problem with the connection and the school hasn't been built. So you've got a whole lot of things going on that are really city government issues um, and the fact that, but it, I, I think for me, I've studied resettlements for the last 25 years and I've never ever seen people trying to get into a resettlement. Um, I've only ever seen people trying to get out of them. And um, also the fact that NGOs are now willing to um, enable forced displacement um, under the, the altruistic guise, guise of climate change, I, I think something that um, a big shift that I've I've only seen in the last kind of five years. Um, so it's a it's a big change from from what we saw in the past with with the kinds of settlements that have conducted. Sorry, just just really quickly, yes. um, to what extent is this an, an anomalous case, and in what case, and to what extent is it sort of a, a indicator of a trend? You're suggesting there's been a shift. I mean. 
towards NGO resettlements in this way. I know various projects. Yeah, I, this is something else. Done by the government, yeah, the state government or the public housing. Was this is one-off case in response to the, the the cyclone, or is it is it a more general trend? So, um, Justin can probably talk more to this. This seems to be a model that they use in the Philippines. Um, this involvement of NGOs. I hadn't seen it um, in other countries that I've worked. Um, partly because of I work in China, where there's little NGO action is obviously difficult, but. Um, yeah, this is this is something very particular, I think, to to the Philippines. This um, kind of charity organisations involved, and also you've got the strong presence of the Catholic Church. Um, so a lot of these NGOs are, um, you know, Catholic based organisations. So, um, yeah, Justin, did you want to say something about that? A lot of the donors don't trust the government, so they'd rather go straight, you know, direct to the people to help them out rather than go through any particular branch of government. So that's why so many NGOs have proliferated because they're by bypassing, in other words, you know, the government going straight to the communities. I mean, Pearly, you have anything more to say? Because Pearly had to travel, you know, all the way to Tacloban to, to join us this afternoon. So Pearly, do you have anything else to say? <laughs> because she doesn't have, you know, good connection. Yeah, actually. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's the that's the reason. No? Because it's also especially that it's the typhoon, Hayan, it's the, the strongest typhoon. So it really attracted a lot of NGOs. So uh, commonly for NGOs, they don't really put so much trust in the government because it takes time to channel the funds and turn, the, turn them into programs. So that is why for CRS, for example, they just coordinated with the Archdiocese of Palo for the Catholic Church in planning out everything and they just leave the other things, for example, the water, the road, and other infra to the government. They focus on the housing alone. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Bernie. Okay, I think we probably um, should uh, close now. Um, thanks for a really good presentation. I'm really looking forward now to following up in two weeks as I'm going to Tech London for another mm -hmm. project. Um, so that it's going to be interesting to see uh, <laughs> if we can see signs of it. Okay, so thank you very much, Justin. That was great. And thank you, everybody. Um, this is the last uh, thinking space for this semester. So I guess we'll see you everyone next semester. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob.